the Florida Gators are working on climbing back to the top of the SEC in football. So I'll tell you the three most likely all SEC offensive candidates. We'll talk about Florida's loss to A&M in the SEC tournament yesterday, which was so much fun. And we'll wrap up by previewing the hopefully dominant Gators baseball weekend coming up only here on Locked On Gators. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Locked On Gators, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day. We are available daily and free wherever you listen to podcasts. Happy Friday. I am Brandon Olson. You can find me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. You can find all my written work with whole nine sports that's w-h-o-l-e and any sports and before getting into the content once again real quick just gonna ask you to like subscribe leave a comment leave a review let me know how i can make the show better please and thank you but we're talking about the top three offensive all sec candidates and i'm putting this in order of most likely to least likely so um don't get so offended about who's first who's second um it, it's just I, i'll give my reasoning for it first up Interior offensive lineman Osiris Torrance. Um, I, I I get that that's a little bit of a weird one, maybe when talking about the offensive line and how it's going to be very probably inconsistent early on for the Florida Gators. But Osiris Torrance is someone who we have immediate high expectations for. He is already experienced in this offense. He's one of the two players on this list that is already experienced in this Billy Napier offense. I think you can guess the other one at this point, but. Yes, he is one of the two players on this list that are already experienced in this Florida Gators offense. We saw Osiris Torrens. If you watch any Louisiana game last year, he dominated every man that lined up across him, except for maybe the Texas game. But even then, I think he had a pretty strong showing, especially in the run game. He is one of the best run blockers in college football. He's an okay pass protector. He's, or I'll say pretty good. I'll say pretty good pass protector, but he is a mover and a mauler in the run game. He's a freak, and I think he's going to have a big year. It's also helpful that he has all the tools to be a dominant offensive lineman, now getting NFL coaching because Rob Sale is the offensive coordinator, taking control of the O-line, and he's got... I mean, NFL experience. So he's got NFL coaching to lead him off with Osiris Torrance. Next up is someone who I know we all love. We all love talking about. We've talked about him quite a bit this week. Quarterback Anthony Richardson is the next most likely all SEC candidate here. And I get it. It's hard to be all SEC. I'm not saying all SEC first team. He could be second or third, but you got Bryce Young down there. That's going to give you a bit of a hard time here but um and obviously spencer rattler is in the sec now but anthony richardson is that guy he's got the gunslinger mentality that's going to equal big explosive passing plays and let's be honest when you look at the all sec plays interceptions don't matter as much so that gunslinger mentality favors you and fortune favors the bold as they always say and anthony richardson is very bold as a quarterback. He's going to be a big play threat throwing the ball. And then we look at the other side of playing quarterback and we look at the athleticism and Anthony Richardson, height, weight, speed, build. He is an athletic freak. Anthony Richardson is a created player at this point. You just throw him in Madden, put 99s across the board and let him, let him figure it out. Uh, and I mean, wow, he really is a creative player. He could do everything, but it's the, the decision-making kind of leads balls too far, kind of leads, comes are too short. He really is just, if you had the controller and you were making bad decisions. Um, so Anthony Richardson in a quarterback friendly offense, I think that this offense is really going to fit his strengths. Big plays downfield screens that are going to create yards after the catch and also screens that are going to boost his completion percentage, which we know that he's going to benefit from because last year wasn't great. And screens are going to kind of make him look, uh, it's going to make him look more efficient. It's going to boost his completion percentage. It's going to get him yards after the catch. And they're probably going to erupt for a big play here or there and add total yards. And it's going to raise his quarterback rating, which is going to be big for him. And like I said, like I, I think that when you look at someone who has a bazooka for an arm, 
has the legs to make all, to make these insane runs and the creativity as a runner to create extra yards, whether it's running through people, running around people, or in Anthony Richardson's case, going over people. He's going to create big plays, a home run hitter at quarterback at its absolute purest definition, and that is Anthony Richardson. And the final player that I put on this list, I was thinking about putting a receiver, but here's the thing. Alabama's got talented receivers. Uh, always. Georgia, talented receivers. I thought about Keon Zipper too, but then I was like, yeah, same thing with talented receivers and tight ends. But I want to put Montreal Johnson um, because I've been very open in that I think early on at least, he is going to be a big time player for the Florida Gators. I think he, at the start of the season, he's going to be the starting running back. I think he's going to be a big play threat. We know that he's got the experience in this wide zone Billy Napier offense, and that he's probably going to make the most of his opportunities. He's got the speed to outrun defense. And like he doesn't even look like he's moving that fast. But I think that is a true testament to speed. Like He doesn't even look like he's moving that fast, but he's outrunning everybody. That's Montreal Johnson. You can look at his uh, his 99-yard run last year where he didn't even look like he was moving that fast, but guess what he was doing? Out running the entire defense, and he was doing it rather handedly. So Montreal Johnson is another guy, and it's a wide-open backfield right now. Damian Pierce is gone. Naquan Wright is there as the only other experienced running back here, but then you've got with Damian Pierce gone. You've got Malik Davis gone. You've got so many snaps that are just waiting to be had, and Montreal Johnson is the only guy that's already comfortable in this offense. He's already got a rapport with at least one of the starting offensive linemen. Why, why not consider him as the guy that could be a killer on the ground? Because he is going to be a big part of this offense. I, I truly and genuinely think so. And now we're going to shift gears to talk about basketball, and we're going to get a lot less positive about it. But first, I want to tell you guys about Built Bar. Well, we're going to stay positive because it's the new year. And that means New Year's resolution time. People often give them up, but hey, summer's coming up. You got to get back in shape, okay? And if you haven't already been doing that, add Built Bar to your plan. I'm horrible at keeping my New Year's resolution. I'm horrible at shape, but I got a trip to Portugal coming up this summer, so I got to do it. Built Bar is going to be the way that I do it. Coated in 100% chocolate, so I get my sweet tooth fix. Most bars have 130 calories and just four net carbs, along with 17, one, seven, grams of protein, throw out the hidden stashes, the Reese's in the desk drawer, the Kit Kat in the cupboard. Just get Built Bar so you don't have to sneak around. You don't have to feel bad. Built Bar is always coming out with new limited time flavors, so you'll never get bored. Use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off of your next order. That is LOCKED, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5. You get 15% off of your next order at Built or BuiltBar.com. Talking about this Florida Gators basketball game from yesterday, <sighs> was just it, it was it was very rough to watch i'm not gonna lie to you uh florida got eliminated in the first round of the sec tournament at the hands of the texas a&m aggies their second time losing to the aggies this year um and i spoke about it in yesterday's episode and i had it tweeted at me at halftime uh by josh Gardner, who love you josh uh if there was going to be a game where we figured out if anybody on this team had that next gear, not the second gear, but that third gear that could really kick it up that so few athletes possess that gear, we would have seen it by now. Um, it would be this game that we would have to see it. We found out who has that gear, and I think it's very good for the Florida Gators in the future because the two players that absolutely took over, you know, Colin Kelson had a great game. I get it. He, he did have a great game, and he was very limited in that first half, but he had a great game overall. Niles Lane and Kawasi Reeves. Those are the two guys that we found out have that gear. Niles Lane took over in the first half with a near double-double in the first half. And Kawasi Reeves took over in the second half where he was just a freak. Just, just clutch threes, a four-point play on the wing, the three-pointer in the corner. To, oh, my Lord. He was a beast. He, he was just an absolute freak. And I see a lot of people praising Flanders Fleming Jr. And I am always down to praise Flanders Fleming Jr. Uh, Y'all know that. And I know so many of you. I need to know. Those of you that saw Fr Flanders Fleming cheering for the Georgia Bulldogs when they won the national championship, how dumb do you feel now? Because since then, he has made a ton of plays. So I need to know how dumb do you feel 
that you wanted him kicked off the team, and he's made so many big plays for the Florida Gators down the stretch. Because I'm just curious. Like, like he's made some phenomenal plays. He's played some great games. So I just want to know, do you still want him off because he – oh, what was it again? Oh, yeah, he cheered for the team that plays in the city that he's from? Like, is that, that's the deal you want to die on? Okay, he made some great plays. But the reason I'm not saying he has that next year because he also made some – absolutely boneheaded play six turnovers including one and in, that was just uh, it was late in the game i can't remember if it was late in the second half or if it was in overtime but colin castleton was in the post and he kind of just bounced it directly at the defender's hand um and it didn't work out and he, he was just boneheaded but i and i'm gonna talk about more players who did not live up to uh their expectations but instead first i am going to talk about a head coach that did not live up to his expectations. That is right. It is Mike White. I put this game on Mike White more than I put the game on Tyree Appleby, who didn't score. More than I put the game on Myron Jones, who had two points. More than I put the game on Flynn Fleming, who had six turnovers. No, 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 no. It's Mike White. Why is it Mike White? Because in the first half, what did the Gators do defensively to start it off? They seemingly randomly double team players i know i've said seemingly randomly it was pretty much every time the ball went on the wing florida was double teaming every time texas and m tried running a pick and roll florida was double teaming and that makes no sense by the way that was stupid to do but the game plan was just awful players played bad but the game plan was a true the game plan was like like 2k bad like it was a very bad plan and yes i'm gonna put it on him yes florida came back and he did a good job down the stretch and look I know that yesterday I was like, oh, Tyree Appleby's got to be the guy that steps up in the big moment. Well, guess what? He didn't. And Mike White made the right decision by sitting Tyree Appleby for pretty much the entirety of the second half. And as much as I hate to say it, that was the right call. As much as I love Tyree Appleby, that was the right call by Mike White to sit him. But again, we have to take a look at if Mike White had coached a better first half of that game, the game doesn't need to go to overtime. No, Florida doesn't need to have this insane run by Kawasi Reeves, and they don't need Niles Lane to drag them through that first half. No, if Mike White coaches a better first half, specifically on the defensive side of the ball, Florida's playing Auburn right now. That's what happened. If Florida, if Mike White coaches a better first half, Florida's playing Auburn in the second round right now. Florida maybe still has a chance at making the March Madness tournament, but right now I'd be willing to bet pretty much anything that they don't make that tournament for the second time in Mike White's seven years. And that's just, that's just God awful. It, it's, it's just, it's truly genuinely just awful to see that Florida is a prestigious basketball program that has been just run into the ground. But Florida fans, I have some good news for you. Very fortunately for Florida, Ole Miss might be looking for a new head coach. And if Ole Miss is looking for a new head coach, it's rumored that Mike White will be the guy that they want to bring on. Mike White will be the guy to go to Ole Miss and to go to the Rebels. And look, Mike, if you want, if Ole Miss calls me, like give him my number. If Ole Miss calls me, I will give you a glowing recommendation because there is nothing that I would like more than to see you move on, spread your wings, and fly away. Just, you know, soar, little birdie, soar. I, I, I cannot wait. I hope, Mike White, I know you're at the top of their list. Please, go ahead. We won't, we won't feel bad for you. We won't, we won't hold anything against you. We want you to find success. But out the gate again, Florida was just doubling the Aggies. I'm going back into the game. Florida was doubling the, the Aggies every time they went on the wing, every time they ran pick and roll. It was just bad basketball. That's what it makes me do. That's what it makes me do. It's just it was just bad basketball. And look, Colin Castleton tried doing his thing. He tried, but the whole offensive game plan of hey Colin, just post open, just post up and hope for the best. Uh didn't actually work because while Colin Castleton was trying to post up on the low block, Texas AM, that you did a fantastic job. I will give Texas AM credit for that because they had Colin Castleton doubled. They had him pushed up so he couldn't get into the low block and he would have to get the high post. So I give Texas A&M defensively absolute credit for that. But at the flip side, Mike White offensively did not change from that game plan for a bit, and it was terrible. And if Niles Lane wasn't playing his ASS off, trying to get offensive rebounds and putbacks and second-chance points, 
this is a blowout. Anyway, I mean, it was a blowout for most of it, and then Florida came back towards the end. Colin Kesslin finished the game with 15 points and six rebounds on six of eleven on seven of eleven shooting. So it was a great game for Colin Kesslin. It was just one where Texas A&M did a very good job of completely blocking him off for most for most of the game. But when he did get to make plays, he made those plays. Florida was completely incapable of taking care of that basketball. It was 18 turnovers for the Florida Gators to 17 assists. It was, it was just bad basketball for the huge majority of the game. Tyree Appleby and Myron Jones combined for just two points on one for 10 shooting along with five assists and four turnovers. And I'll say just, I, it absolutely baffles me. It, it causes me to have an error in my mind that Tyree Appleby and Myron Jones just keep putting up bad shots no matter what happens. And Mike White pretty much benched Tyree Appleby for the huge majority of the second half. And it's like, I, I don't get why it took so – why did it take until the SEC tournament to say, hey, not it? Like, and I love Tyree Appleby and I love Myron Jones. I do. But the, just there's so many game plans and there are so many games and so many outcomes where it's just if Tyree Appleby and Myron Jones were more efficient – this is a win for the Gators. And this is another one of those games where if they played more efficient, they didn't turn the ball over a ton. If they made better passes, they didn't shoot a ton of dumb shots, then they got it. And I think that this game, the biggest takeaway from it is that the Florida Gators have two players on their roster right now that are going to be stars in, in, in Gainesville. They will. They're going to be stars in Gainesville. Niles Lane and Kwasi Reeves, like just round of applause because that was – one of the best performances that I've seen from a, a freshman duo, 37 points off the bench, 15 rebounds, and just stellar all around from both of them. So clutch throughout. Without them, this game is a massacre for the Texas A&M Aggies. And it, it's just, it's also saddening that for a team that is filled with transfers and, and upperclassmen and grad transfers, that the freshmen need to be the one, they, the underclassmen need to be the one to carry this game for them and it's, it's just so wildly disappointing but we're about to talk about something a little more lighthearted, ebbs and flows here but first i'm gonna tell you about bet online did anybody else make money this weekend i could tell you yesterday whew, i did not bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your sports action obviously florida you screwed me Countless times at this point. One of the reasons I hate Mike White so much now. BetOnline.net covers award shows, TV shows, and reality TV with real-time updated odds and props on almost anything you can imagine. It's the best way to place your bets, and it's 100% free to sign up. Head to the website or use your mobile device and sign up there. BetOnline.net is where the game starts, and once the game ends, it's where you're going to go to see how your winnings made. Because, you know, Make money. That's how you do it. Scare money, don't make money. Now we're going to wrap up today's show by talking about Florida Gators baseball weekend ahead. Florida Gators midweek series ended up becoming just a one-off game as the Wednesday game against Jacksonville got postponed due to a, due to a bit of a storm there. I don't know if you heard about it. But yeah, there was a bit of a storm there. The first game on Tuesday night, though, did happen. And it was one that um, if you were hoping for a blowout for the Florida Gators... A little bit of a little bit of a, a blood pressure test for you there because it was a very tight game and it also wasn't a great game if you're the type of person who loves high scoring tons of runs but luckily for me for myself personally um i i, I like pitching and i like defense so I, I love those low scoring games and that is exactly what we had on tuesday night the gators walked away with a one to zero win over jacksonville and even that run didn't come until the bottom of the sixth inning, where Kendrick Kelly Lau hit a single that brought in Wyatt Langford. And I mean, Kendrick Kelly Lau also had a double in that game, but Wyatt Langford did not score on that. So <laughs> Kendrick Kelly Lau brought in Wyatt Langford, and it was the only run of the game in the bottom of the sixth inning. And the Florida Gators, once again, um, they had no problem getting hits and getting on base, but they did struggle to drive in runs and convert those opportunities. And it, it's something that, that we've seen happen now with both the baseball and softball team for the Florida Gators, where getting on base is not an issue. Getting hits is not an issue. 
but driving in those runs really is the issue. And it's not so much an issue with, with softball. They've been a lot more consistent and a lot more productive than the Florida Gators, the Florida Gators baseball team. But it, it's still a bit of an issue. But, that, hey, this, this is not a softball <laughs> uh, not a softball segment. Tyler Nesbitt for the Florida Gators got the start on Tuesday. He pitched two innings, allowed one hit, walked one, and struck out three. Then Ryan Slater came in to pitch those middle five innings, and he allowed one hit, struck out two, and then Nick Ficarata came in to pitch the final two innings, allowing guess how many? That's right, one hit, walking two, and striking out two more. Apparently, that's the threshold. As a Florida Gators pitcher on Tuesday, you were allowed to give up one hit, and that's it. After that, you're done, and hey, they stuck to it. Good job. That That is a strategy for success. If you're the Florida Gators, one hit per pitcher, there you go. You Congrats, you cracked the code. This weekend, though, starting today, it's going to be hmm, a massacre, I think. The Florida Gators, I'm so sorry. That is just going to, I'm just going to knock on wood right now because that's going to be rough. But the Florida Gators are taking on the Seton Hall Pirates, who are a whopping zero in 10 on the season so far, including this past Tuesday, they picked up their second biggest loss of the season. The last game that they played was their second biggest loss of the season against Florida Atlantic as they lost 19 to six. And I love so much, so much that that is their second biggest loss of the season and their second time giving up or allowing 19 runs in a game because in the opening series of the season, Seton Hall allowed 19 runs in another game against North Carolina, and that was a game in which they lost 19 to 0. So Seton Hall, um, you could say that their pitching is bad. You could say that their that their offense is bad. You, I, I don't think you could make an argument for which one is worse and come away with a definitive answer because um, they're both not good. But yeah, I, I don't know which one you would say is worse, but they suck is a good way to put it. But I mean, you, you can look at this, and I, again, I don't want to speak in absolutes. I don't like speaking in absolutes, although I do sometimes, like when I just said Florida should be involved in a massacre this weekend. Um, but the Florida Gators should dominate this series, and I, I think that's not um, – I think I'm not being hyperbolic when I say that. Like, like Florida could win all three of these games by – six or more runs every game um they should and if they don't dominate this series then i think we've got to ask about ask a few questions about this gator team and say you know how good are you because and i get it seton hall's 7 10 but i think you have to ask the question how good are you because we just watched the florida gators men's basketball team who early on looked pretty good and then they lost to a team that had not won a game yet um Obviously, very different talent-wise and coaching-wise. But still, it, it's a parallel that I'm not comfortable with. Uh, at least in this case, if Florida loses one of those games, we could say, you know, at least it took us three tries to lose to a winless team um, instead of just that one. But uh, I, I think that when you look at this game, you look at – or this series, you look at the Florida Gators have an opportunity to run it up offensively and defensively and pitching wise absolutely dominate that's going to be a big confidence booster on both sides and i think that's big because you know florida played miami this past weekend and this tuesday they take on florida state and then next week a week from today they start sec play against alabama so you look at this game against seton hall the series against seton hall and you go this can be big for florida to get kind of not i don't want to say a slump bars because they're not slumping but as a confidence booster and a confidence builder and kind of a, are you that dominant team or are you a team that's going to play down to your competition? I think that's something that we're going to get answered for, by Florida this weekend and starting today at 6 p.m. Eastern time, tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern time and Sunday, I believe noon Eastern time. Um, but this is a game for Florida where you, you or series where you should dominate 
and we, we have to hope that you dominate and you can kind of build off of this as the season continues because we're getting into the thick of things now. But the Florida Gators baseball team getting built up, getting hyped up, and hopefully getting the – well, hopefully Seton Hall is getting run up. Thanks for making Lock Thinkers your first listen of the day every day. We are available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcast. We'll be back Monday with more on your Florida Gators. Now make your second listen, Locked on NFL Draft. Ryan Tracy and former NFL cornerback Eric Crocker bring the draft to life every day with insight and analysis on college football prospects and NFL front offices. For Locked on Gators, I'm Brandon Olson. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with Whole Nine Sports. That is W-H-O-L-E. And I any sports, including some NFL draft interviews that have been coming out this week and are going to continue coming out. Um, you can find those on YouTube and also fire Mike White.